to the Narrow Path radio broadcast. My name is Steve Gregg, and we're live for a half hour again this morning, as we are each weekday, with open phone lines for you to call in if you have and wish to raise questions about the Bible, questions about Christianity, about the Christian faith, about your own spiritual life, your own spiritual journey. We can talk about those things, and that would mean... Uh, <clears throat> whether you're a Christian or not, uh, whether you agree with the host or not, you're, you're always welcome to call with alternative views uh, and not necessarily agree with what this host has to say. We're glad to hear from you in any case. Right now our lines are wide open. We have no calls waiting. Of course, I've not given out the number yet. So let me do that, and we can talk to you. Now let me urge you to call as early as you possibly can because this program ends in less than 30 minutes. And therefore, if you turn around, it'll be gone. Uh, while you're thinking about it, now make the call 1 800 227 5278. That's 1 800 227 5278. And uh, once a month, I have a meeting uh, in uh, Temecula, where I live, an evening meeting on a Saturday night. And uh, for the entire week before that Saturday, I usually announce it, so I hope people don't get tired of hearing about it. But if you live in or near uh, Temecula and would like to join us uh, this Saturday night, uh, we are going to be, uh, uh, I'm going to be giving a lecture called Why I'm Still a Christian. And this lecture is particularly, I think, uh, useful for people who have had some questions about their Christianity, why they, you know, why they are still a Christian after all. Uh, was it just because you were raised a Christian? Is it just because uh, some years ago someone made a, a strong appeal, an emotional appeal, uh, and you responded, and now you're having second thoughts, maybe third thoughts? Uh, there are lots of people within the range of my voice who identify themselves essentially as Christians, but they're not really firm. They're not really sure if, if challenged. Uh, why they would be able to say they are a Christian or to give an answer that makes sense to a, a questioner about that. Uh, if you're interested in coming or, or bringing, say, high school or college-age kids who, who fit that description, that meeting will be this Saturday night in Temecula, where I live, and the uh, location is actually at the Pechanga uh, Great Oak Clubhouse, I think it's called. It's, the, it's run by the Boys and Girls Club of the city. And uh, the map, time, and location, all that stuff can be found at our website, which is thenarrowpath.com. Thenarrowpath.com. If you go to the link that says Announcements, you'll find not only the information about the meeting, but a map to it. And uh, I'd urge you to come uh, as early as possible. Last time we had the place so packed out, a lot of people had to sit out in the hallway and so forth. And uh, so the earlier you come, the better. But uh, even if you get there at your convenience, and it's not very early, I'm sure you'll be able to get within earshot. And I do believe you'll find the lecture helpful. I've only given this lecture one time before, and it was about five or six years ago, I think. And uh, so it's not a lecture I've given a lot. And it's not going to be exactly like the last time, simply because, well, I'm older now. And uh, I have more reasons than ever for being a Christian. And so, uh, join us there this Saturday night if you can. Let's talk, first of all, today to Robert from Huntington Beach, California. Uh, Robert, welcome to The Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. Sure. Thanks for having the show. Um, mm -hmm. So, my, my question is, who do you see, uh, or who do you say is modern, what country is modern Babylon? Well, Iraq is where Babylon was. Uh, sure. So, uh, but I don't think there is a modern-day Babylon. I think that uh, ancient ancient Babylon is, uh, of course, the ruins of ancient Babylon are still in Iraq, which is the the modern country that that now occupies that territory. But uh, there are people who think there will be a revival of Babylon in the end times. This they base primarily, I think, on the way they would look at the Book of Revelation, 
in the book of Revelation, there's, uh, a, a, you know, a, an antagonist there represented as a harlot drunk with the blood of the saints, obviously a persecutor of Christians called Babylon. And so many people are feeling that there's going to be a future uh, power in the world, which is referred to by this this term, Babylon, Mystery Babylon the Great, the Mother of Harlots, it's called in Revelation 17. Now, <clears throat> back when Saddam Hussein was uh, in power, uh, there were quite a few popular Christian books that came out trying to argue that he was rebuilding ancient Babylon and that, therefore, ancient Babylon is referred to in Revelation and that it'll be uh, a major force in the end times. Uh, now that Hussein is gone, uh, many people... Uh, have moved away from that viewpoint. Uh, no one ever moved toward it until the current events made them think that way. This is an example of what I call newspaper exegesis. Uh, people who don't let the Bible interpret itself, they let the newspapers interpret the Bible. That's always a tenuous practice and usually leads to a lot of silly theories that are embarrassing once the news changes. But uh, I don't think the Bible uh, makes any predictions about the revival of ancient Babylon. And almost all scholars believe that Babylon in Revelation is symbolic for something else. Uh, yeah. Probably, probably the majority think? of... What's that? I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead. Probably the majority of scholars have identified it with Rome. But not Rome in modern times, but Rome in ancient times. They, they believe that John and the churches he is writing to viewed Rome, which was their persecutor, as sort of a modern incarnation of Babylon, modern in their day, not in ours. Uh, <clears throat> so they, many think that Revelation is talking about Rome. Now, the Reformers thought that Babylon was a reference to the Roman Catholic papacy. Uh, and that was a very popular view among Protestants. Uh, dispensationalists today uh, often are uh, you know, not real clear on what Babylon is. Some of them think it refers to the world system. Some believe it refers to some uh, united council of apostate churches in the end times. There's all kinds of views about it. My own view is that it probably either is a reference to Rome in John's time or even to Jerusalem in John's time. Now, that's, that, that might seem really bizarre to say possibly Jerusalem, but the reason I say that is because of the way that Revelation, Revelation uses symbolic language. For example, in Revelation chapter 11 and verse 8, it refers to the city where our Lord was crucified, clearly Jerusalem. And it says that city is spiritually called Egypt and Sodom. Mm -hmm. So here we have Jerusalem being referred to as Egypt and as Sodom. Uh, it's, it's a small step from there to referring to it as Babylon as well. In other words, taking the names of ancient, corrupt pagan civilizations and applying them to corrupt, apostate Jerusalem. And... Uh, so that that's that's a, a case can be made for that. Though I'm not I'm not uh, steadfast on any one position about that. Ever consider? Uh, have you ever considered that it's America? Well, yeah, that's I mean, another thing. State. When I, yeah, when I was when I was uh, uh, in Europe the first time back in what 1972, I asked the Christians there uh, what they thought. Babylon was, because the, the church I was going to thought that Babylon represented some end times uh, conglomerate uh, apostate religious system. And all the Europeans I met who were Christians said, well, we, we believe it's New York, you know, sure. New York City. Uh, so obviously there are people who believe it could be America. I don't think it's likely, but that has a lot to do with my understanding of Revelation as a whole. Uh, many people just assume... A lot of people assume that Revelation as a whole is talking about the end times, modern times. But there are other views, and one of the views I find more persuasive is that John is talking to the people of his own time about a crisis that was looming in their own day. But he speaks in very symbolic language because he's writing an apocalyptic book. I don't know, as All I right. read it, I see, I see a lot of different descriptions of... Everybody that got rich waxed off, you know, waxed rich off of her trade and because of her costliness. There's so many things in there that just make me think, like, holy smokes, that's America. Well, if it so, is talking uh, about our time, yeah, if it is talking about our time, America would be a very good candidate. I, 
But but if it's talking about some other time, there are other cities that have had that same status at other times in history. That's that's what we have to remember. It's if we're assuming that Revelation is talking about the end times, then we look for a modern society that fits that description, and America fits it well enough. Uh, but if we say, well, but maybe this isn't talking about the end times. Maybe this is talking about some other period of history that's already passed. Uh, then, of course, there are other cities, Rome being one of them, that could fit that description in its own day. Right, but it wasn't destroyed in one hour. Well, that's true. Right. That's true. It wasn't destroyed in one hour. So I That's mean, one was, reason I don't think it's the fall of Rome either. It's, I, I, that's another reason I feel that Jerusalem is a better candidate than Rome. But, there's, again, there's a lot of different theories out there, and I don't think anybody can be uh, you know, too dogmatic about, about their own theory about that. There's just too many options. Well, I'll tell you just kind of what bothers me is every, as certain as I am that the shore will see waves lap upon them, or, you know, the, the waves never end. And basically every single day I turn on the newspaper, there is something more shocking that's being reported. And then I look over to Revelations where it says, you know, it has become the place of everything unclean and evil and uh, every filthy bird or, you know, whatever, however right. it's written. And well, I, well I, that's, that's, just what I, that's just what I was saying, that, if, if Revelation is talking about these days, then you're right. America is a good candidate. There may be even others in the future. Um, that is to say, let's say America, like every other empire before it, eventually goes down and something else rises instead as the major world power. Well, the people of that time will probably think that is a reference. To, that, that is what is referred to in Babylon, as Babylon in Revelation. So in every age people who think that Revelation is talking about their own age can usually identify some society that fits that description. And you're right. There's always new corruptions uh, being introduced in our present society. But that was true in ancient Babylon. That was true in ancient Rome. That was true in ancient Egypt. That was true in Sodom. I mean, in other words, we're not the first society to fit that description. We're just the latest. And so if we're assuming that Revelation is about the latest then that's going to probably give more fuel to the fire of uh, identifying America as Babylon. But if we're not so sure that it's referring to the latest or the, that which is current, then it leaves open other possibilities. My own thought is it doesn't really matter for me to know. Let, let's, say, let's say America is Babylon. Let's, let's take your theory. I'm, I'm not, you know, I don't have any emotional resistance to it. I believe America has become something of a Babylon uh, in our generation, but suppose it is the the, the Babylon mentioned in Revelation. Um, what if I didn't know that? Would it change my life? What, what if I did or didn't know? What, how you know? What would that change in my life? Whether you stay here or not, I guess. You know, like in what, 18 four, it says, "Come out of her, my children," you know, so you don't I have see. to suffer plagues. I see. So, so yeah. So, so leaving America would be perhaps what you want to do. Now, see, you could, you could come to that point whether or not you believed America was Babylon, because there's been many times throughout history where people left their homeland because of persecution or war or other things. Uh, I mean, even even the Christians left Jerusalem in AD 70 to escape the coming problems there. Uh, sure. In America, you know, the trouble is, in the history of America, America has always been the freest place, and people from other oppressed nations would flee here. And that is the mentality we've had for 200 years or so, and, it, and therefore it seems very strange to us, the idea of fleeing from America to somewhere else. And most people, if you suggest something like that, they're going to say, well, <clears throat> okay, America is getting worse, but wh what's better? Is there any better place than this to flee to? And that is the, the, the problem that people have when they consider fleeing from America. But a lot of people don't even consider fleeing from America because it just seems so out of, I don't know, it just, the, the times we live in have changed so quickly that we haven't gotten used to the fact that America may not be a place that people should flee to, but the opposite in, in the near future. Mm. But, yeah, you got an interesting, interesting position. Okay. Yeah, the other, well, thank you. Yeah, the other thought is that nobody reads the Bible. Every hotel room has a Bible. There's Bibles everywhere, but nobody, nobody that I know, really actually reads the words of the Bible. It's a 
Yeah, well, I do, so, but, but some people don't. Yeah, fewer, fewer people do excited. than used to. All right. I appreciate your, your comments, Robert. Uh, let's talk next to, uh, it's going to be David from Whittier, California. Hey, David, welcome to The Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. Hi, hi Steve. Uh, pleasure to talk with you and just ask a question. I he- I've heard you refer to yourself as a partial preterist, and I'm just mm-hmm. curious. I-, I think I probably should just go get a, a book of theology and see what they say of uh, systematic theology, what a preterist is. But, you know, what is- if you could summarize the major differences preterist and a partial preterist, what would they be? And I'll listen on the radio. Okay, David, thanks for your call. Thank you. The word, the word preterist comes from the, the Latin word praetor, which means past. Um, if you believe that a, a given prophecy, let's say the book of Revelation, if you believe that the book of Revelation was fulfilled in the past, then your position is a preterist position. That is a pastist. You believe it was fulfilled in the past. If you believe Revelation is going to be fulfilled in the future, then you're the opposite. You're a futurist. So a futurist is someone who expects a future fulfillment of some prophecy. And a, a preterist is someone who believes in a past fulfillment of some prophecy. Now, a, a partial preterist is somebody who believes that part of the prophecies in the Bible have been fulfilled in the past, but not all. Therefore, a partial preterist is also a partial futurist. That is when you take all the prophecies in the Bible, the partial preterist says says some of them have been fulfilled in the past and some of them remain to be fulfilled in the future. Um, Now, a a full preterist, the, the the, the next step, a full preterist is someone who believes that all the prophecies in the Bible have been fulfilled in the past. (coughs) This is a very, uh, to my mind, a very radical position and it's not held by a very large percentage of evangelicals, though there are some, some strong voices uh, advocating it. Uh, I debated against the full preterist not very long ago in, in Denver. Uh, and it was, from what I understand, Don Preston, who I debated, was actually, is probably one of the, the strongest advocates of full preterism today. Their view <coughs> is that there are no prophecies waiting to be fulfilled in the future. And therefore, they believe everything in the Bible that's predicted happened. And they usually think it happened back around 70 A.D. when Jerusalem fell. So their view would be there's no future second coming of Christ that's predicted. That happened in A.D. 70. There's no future resurrection. There's no end of the world predicted. There's no new heavens, new earth to be looked forward to. That happened in 70 A.D. Now you might say, well, how could they say such crazy things as that? Well, they say that by taking those prophecies in a spiritual sense, not a literal sense. So they kind of... uh, they take everything symbolically and everything spiritually that, that speaks of those things so that it's possible for them to identify something uh, in, that happened you know, a long time ago uh, as the thing that was predicted in the prophecy. So, so they don't believe there's any future prophecy fulfillments. So they would be full preterists. Preterist means, of course, believing in something fulfilled in the past. Now, a partial preterist usually and I would fit this description, usually thinks that most of the book of Revelation was fulfilled in the past and that most of the Olivet Discourse, that's, of course, Matthew 24, was fulfilled in the past. Usually a partial preterist believes that A.D. 70 and the destruction of Jerusalem is what was predicted in the Olivet Discourse and in Revelation for the most part. But because a person like me is called a partial preterist, it means that I don't believe that everything that is predicted, has been fulfilled in the past. There still is a future second coming of Christ. There still is a future resurrection of the dead. There's still a future rapture of the church. There's still a future new heavens and new earth. In other words, a partial preterist believes many things the same way as a futurist, because a partial preterist is a partial futurist. Now, what's ironic here is that some people who don't make any distinction just assume that any preterist is the same as any other preterist. But the truth is that all Christians are partial preterists. Because every Christian believes some prophecies in the Bible have been fulfilled. For example, we believe about 300 Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah have been fulfilled in Jesus. Uh, at least if we, if we don't believe that, we're not, we don't believe the Bible because the Bible identifies certain things Jesus did as fulfillments of prophecy. Therefore, we believe that some of the prophecies in the Bible have been fulfilled and some have not. Only a full preterist believes that none remain to be fulfilled. But a partial preterist can believe any number of prophecies still remain to be fulfilled, but believe that some have been fulfilled. 
the main difference between a person who's identified generally today as a partial preterist and any other Christian is simply the number of prophecies that, that, uh, that he thinks have been fulfilled. Because all Christians think some prophecies have been fulfilled, therefore technically all are partial preterists. But the partial preterists, even those who call themselves that, don't even agree among themselves necessarily about, in every case, about every individual prediction, whether it's been fulfilled or not. That is something that they consider to be open to, to examination. I do. And I believe that the prophecies about the future second coming of Christ and resurrection of the dead have not been fulfilled. I believe that's going to happen in the future. Uh, but I do believe that there are a lot of prophecies that people have traditionally applied to the end times, which in their context in the Bible are not talking about the, what we call the end times at all. They're talking about things that have been fulfilled. And there's nothing heretical about doing that, by the way, although some people are very uncomfortable with it, because a partial preterist usually challenges the uh, dispensational view, the futurist view of Revelation. And a lot of people have a lot of emotional uh, investment in their future, in futures view of Revelation. So a partial preterist is like anybody else, thinks that some prophecies have been fulfilled in the past and that some are going to be fulfilled in the future. They may not agree with certain other Christians as to which ones have been fulfilled and which ones have not. Uh, but they would agree on in, in, in most instances. The full preterist doesn't think there's anything remaining to be fulfilled. All right, before we run out of time, we're going to talk here to Josh from Redondo Beach, California. Josh, welcome to The Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. Yes, good morning, Steve. Uh, I called you last Friday, and I told you I heard a preacher say, you know, God had no beginning or no ending. Yeah. And uh, I couldn't find anything in my concordance, and you suggested that I looked up everlasting to everlasting, and right. you thought I could find it in the book of Psalms. Well, you were correct. I did find it in the book of Psalms, right. uh, saying God is everlasting to everlasting. It was uh, chapter uh, 90, verse 2. And uh, so you did direct me to answer my question, and I just wanted to thank you. Oh, okay. Well, great. I'm sorry I didn't remember the verse number at the time. Uh, now that you mention it, I do recall that chapter 90 would make sense. I still would have known it was verse 2 without looking it up. But chapter uh, Psalm 90 is a psalm written by Moses, actually, uh, one of the few psalms written by Moses. And uh, I do now that you mention it remember that line being in there. Well, yeah, right, so if, just... any, if anybody called you in the future with a similar question, you'd know right where to go. But I wanted to thank you for your help. So you just called to say thank you. Well, I appreciate that. Where are the other nine? Pardon me? Where are the other nine lepers who didn't come back and say thank you? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> That's all right. Most people who call do thank me, and it doesn't matter if they do or not. I appreciate it. Thank you okay. for calling. Thank you, Carl. God bless. All right. Bye now. All right. Well, uh, you know, we've uh, just cleared our board, and I think we have like three minutes left, so if you want to be the last voice on the program, uh, the last caller, anyway, you can get through. Here's the number, 1-800-227-5278. If you don't want to talk long, we've got a couple minutes left, and you can have the final word. 1-800-227-5278. You're listening to The Narrow Path. I want to remind you that The Narrow Path is a listener-supported ministry. You know, we have two shows a day. Uh, not on the same stations, though. The, the station, we have an afternoon show that's an hour long. Now, this morning show is only a half hour each weekday. But every weekday, I come back to the microphone for an hour from 2 to 3, and uh, we have exactly the same kind of show, but it's broadcast in other areas, Seattle, Portland, Las Vegas, uh, Central California, uh, Sacramento, and so forth. And um, you can hear that program, too, on, from our website. Uh, where you're listening now, if you're listening on the radio, you wouldn't be able to pick up the stations that we're on in the afternoon. But uh, this program and the other one in the afternoon, every day, can be heard uh, or even downloaded for later listening from our website, which is thenarrowpath.com. And besides that, we have about um, eight years' worth of programs, Narrow Path programs, archived 
at our website, and you can listen to them. There's thousands, thousands of programs there. Likewise, there's about 900 lectures online on different topics in different parts of the Bible, actually verse by verse through the Bible, and on topics at the website. Everything's free. We want you to know that. And the only expenses we really have in the ministry pretty much are paying for the time on the radio. But we don't have any sponsors for that, and we don't sell anything. So uh, we are listener-supported. And at the end of the program, I'll give you information about how to uh, donate if you want to. But right now, we want to give Ellie from Irvine as much time as we can. Ellie, welcome to The Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. Uh, or even download it for later. Oh, Ellie, you need to be listening to the phone, not the radio. It's the narrow path.com. Oh, my Sorry? Goodness. Okay. Am I yeah, running out of time? Turn your radio down. Turn your radio down because oh, you okay. won't know whether you're listening to me now or 30 seconds from now. Okay, okay. okay. I, I want to ask you a question. Can I ask a question right now? Yes, yes, but I don't have very much time, but please hurry. Yes. I'm a new Christian, and I, I've been confused which Bible to start to read and which, you know, to, to because I, I read all over the place, but I, I, I like some of it, but some of it, I, it's like uh, I, I need to start from some other places. Do you, can you comment about that? Well, most Bibles are pretty much the same in their contents. The only thing uh -huh. they differ in is the way that things are specifically worded. But any good Bible is going to say the same thing, essentially, as any other good Bible, because all the Bibles in English are translated from the same Greek and Hebrew originals. So uh, some translators use some English words and some use different English words, but they all pretty much are going to have to mean the same thing or else they're not being faithful translators. Uh, I don't know what, tr what Bible you use currently. I use the New King James, and I like it. Uh, there's another good one in English. The, the English Standard Version uh, is a good one. Uh, the New American Standard Version is a good one. There's, uh, any of those Bibles would be just fine. Um, and then uh, from your accent, I take it that you maybe have English as a second language. I don't know what Bibles may be available in your language, but that could be found online. But I appreciate your call. I'd love to talk to you more, but I'm going to be cut off here in 15 seconds. If you'd like to help us stay on the air, you can go to our website, thenarrowpath.com, and find out how to do that. There's a donate link there, thenarrowpath.com. Thanks for joining us. Let's talk again tomorrow. Hello, good morning. We're so glad you could join us today to listen to The Narrow Path. And many thanks to our callers, to you, our listeners, and of course to our host, Steve Gregg, for today's great program. This live interactive call-in program strives to answer your questions about the Bible and Christianity. And we welcome all of the callers, and we're so glad that you're all here to listen to Steve's great answers. This ministry requires support, though. Uh, Steve does not sell anything, nor does he accept funding from any other source except listeners. So if you'd like to be able to assist this ministry, then we do encourage you to go to Steve's website, thenarrowpath.com, and you'll find a place there that you can give safely and securely, and it's very easy to find and navigate. That's very important. That's at thenarrowpath.com. But if you would like to be able to give in another way and you don't want to do it on, an, on the Internet at the website, then please give K-Bright a call, and we'll give you additional contact information for Steve Gregg. Call us at 800-227-2337. Please remember that the views and opinions on this program are those of the participants and not necessarily those of Crawford Broadcasting Company, its ownership, management, or its advertisers. Joyce Meyer is coming up next here on AM740 K-Bright. Today on The Bottom Line, Disney wants to change Boy Scouts of America policy regarding homosexuality. I'd call it extortion. We'll talk about that today at 3. Plus, Christians are being forced to submit or face the sword in Syria. We'll explain what that means today at 3 on The Bottom Line on AM 740 K Bright. 50,000 watts of discerning talk radio for Southern California. This is KBRT and KBRT HD Costa Mesa. And on the web at KBRT740.com. Welcome to Enjoying Everyday Life with New York Times bestselling author Joyce Meyer. On today's program, Joyce will be teaching on confidence with the teaching titled The Cure for the Insecure. Have you ever asked yourself, who am I? When you search for an identity and find that you are not sure about the person you are. Being confident in oneself is a challenge that you may face daily. 
Whether it be in your job, your family, or even in the body of Christ, God knows who you are. And if you learn to trust in Him, He will give you the confidence and blessing to know who you are and that you are following His will for your life. Listen today as Joy shares what the cure is for insecurity, for peace, joy, and righteousness in God. Now here's Joyce with today's teaching, The Cure for the Insecure. And really, even though you're born again, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to cheat in a game of hide-and-go-seek, so to speak, once in a while in your life. Because although we're dead to sin, that new part of us, that born-again part of us, wants nothing to do with sin. Romans 6, 2 says you are dead to sin. Sin is not dead. Sin is still alive and well on planet Earth. And the devil, right there when I was a nine-year-old child and I had my head against my grandma's white boarded house, and my cousins were off hiding, and that old devil tempted me to peek. And, of course, I didn't know anything about resisting temptation, so I peeked, and I, I really thought I lost my salvation. So from then until I was, like, in my 20s, it's amazing how the devil can lie to us and steal from us Things that really we haven't lost, but if we believe we've lost them, then that's our reality. And I wonder how many people sit here, how many are watching by TV? And maybe you one time had a good relationship with God, and then you made some kind of a big mistake, and the devil said, that's it. God doesn't want anything to do with you now. He's mad at you. Forget you. You can never come back. Well, the devil is a liar. And don't let him do to you what he did to me 